three. Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raviki. I'm very excited to have John Stewart here. Some of you have been noting there's been uh, several people on here, Scott Jordan, Richard Blundell, and, uh, uh, who are talking about uh, a bigger evolutionary meta-narrative, uh, deep uh, time, um, and what this means for responding to the meaning crisis. John reached out for me, and this is very much his, his uh, area of work. He does a lot of work on evolutionary theory. Um, and what I find comprehensively interesting about him is how he can reach into the nuts and bolts, and I read some of his academic work about this, and that on the other hand, how he can reach out to, you know, people who are considering practices of transformation, what that means individually and collectively. And John is speaking to this whole gamut in a consistent and very powerful way. And so I'm very, uh, very excited to have him here. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, John. It's uh, great to be here. Um, so I'll just quickly outline my background and uh, then lead into why I reached out to you and so on. So, yeah, basically, I'm an Australian-based evolutionary theorist. I'm a member of the Evolution, uh, Cognition and Complexity uh, Research Group of the Free University of Brussels. It's a group led by Francis Haligan, who is a well-known cybernetician, general systems theorist, big picture thinker. Um, I've had more than a dozen papers uh, published in international science journals, peer-reviewed in national science journals. Uh, and I've been, my main focus is to identify um, the nature of the big, uh, the large-scale evolutionary processes that have uh, tuned and formed life on Earth and that, most importantly, will determine our future. You know, it'll determine where humanity can go from here. Um, yes, yeah, so I was... I, however, I've never worked as an academic. Um, I did my science degree at the University of Queensland and towards the end of the degree, I surveyed um, uh, evolutionary science uh, to see you know, whether there was a career in that for me in, the, in, in academia. I basically came to the conclusion that evolutionary science at the time, and this was the early to mid 1970s, um, was allergic to big picture, mm, big mm, picture thinking. Mm. Uh, it was more, you know, logical positivism, you know, reductionist approaches to science. And in, in fact, it was intentionally put down that track by the, uh, by meetings of the leading evolutionary science scientists in the 1940s um, as part of a profession building project where mm. they, Mm. decided to constrain evolutionary science away from the big picture stuff, particularly big picture human evolution because of the dangers, um, you know, and the controversy that that would, that would raise. So they were successful. Um, the evolutionary science that existed in the, in, in the 70s, uh, I didn't want to spend my life measuring and counting, as I put it, because right. that's what it was like. It was like rats and stats in psychology. Right. So in any event, um, uh, my, but my, my central interest in my life was evolution and developing a, uh, a big picture understanding of evolution and particularly its implications for humanity. So that's what I worked on, published papers and so on, as I've indicated. Mm -hmm. and, what that led that, and what that led me to uh, was to become what I would call an evolutionary activist. Mm -hmm. So an evolutionary activist is, is someone who uh understands the trajectory of evolution on earth and in particular where that trajectory goes into the future and what its implications are for humanity how we organize ourselves and how we evolve ourselves individually and collectively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so broadly speaking um the the big picture that emerges um is that evolution is going somewhere it's not some random process it's going somewhere and it's more akin to a developmental process. So on Earth, we've had uh, the stepwise increase in the scale of cooperative organisation amongst living processes on Earth. And that stepwise process, key events in it were the, the first proto cells um, were cooperatives of molecular processes and then cooperatives of those simple cells 
uh, became the, you, the more complex eukaryote cell, and right. then and then cooperatives of eukaryote cells became the multicellular organisms, of which we're an example, along with with other animals. And then a further stepwise part of that process was the uh, emergence of cooperatives of organisms, cooperatives of organisms of multicellular organisms, of which ant colonies are, are an example, and uh, human groups are an example as well. And then within human evolution, we had a continuation of that stepwise process from kin groups to bands to tribes to uh, agricultural communities and city states and empires. And now we have, so, so cooperation originally uh, was between molecular processes at the start of this developmental process. Cooperation was at the scale of a millionth of a metre. Um, but the successive increase in the scale of cooperation manifesting as these, uh, this sequence of the emergence of cooperative entities where each new cooperative uh, is a cooperative of the entities that, ex that emerged at the level below. Um, that that uh, process has continued with humans um, and brought us to where we are today, where we have cooperation uh, way beyond a millionth of a metre. And now we have cooperative organisations called nation states that manifest as cooperation between organisms on the scale of a continent, um, yeah. for example. Yes. And, you know, and markets are extending that cooperation to a limited extent uh, globally. So the, this developmental process, it's, it's really obvious where the next step is. The next step um, is a repetition at a larger scale of the steps that have occurred previously. So the, the nation states that are now destructively competing with one another, which is how each new level begins destructive competition. Right. right. Um, that destructive competition, which is manifesting as, as uh, global warming, uh, which is likely to, to end human civilization in the century. That's how destructive that competition is. Um, and, and manifesting as, as the threat of nuclear war, um, that, um, uh, that destructive competition uh, can, as it has at previous levels, uh, be converted to cooperation between nation states to form a larger scale entity. And, and it will complete the developmental process, this next step, because it will result in a, a, a larger scale entity on the scale of the planet, um, which is as large as you can get, obviously. Um, and, the, and, and we can look at these previous steps in the evolution of, of cooperation of increasing scales to see how that will be achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, basically involves the need for global governance, the suppression and constraining of the uh, destructive competition between nation states, the emergence of this global superorganism. Now, the, that brings, brings me to a critical point um, that establishes the need for evolutionary activism. Uh, broadly speaking, up until now, this developmental process has occurred automatically. It hasn't occurred intentionally. Um, it hasn't been driven by consciousness. Um, it's been driven by natural selection, natural selection based on competition and the superior adaptability of cooperation. So, John, can uh, I just interject? Yep. Sure. Uh, uh, so, you make it very clear there's a trajectory, but you do not see any teleology in it. And you're addressing that point right now, right? So, you're Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Right, right. Okay. Uh, so, it's. It's so that's that's part of the reason for the activism. There's no there's nothing there's no future that's pulling us forward uh, towards anything. There is just a causally driven process. Uh, but and you also take pains um, to distinguish your thesis the you know you know this increasing holy holy archy of uh, cooperation from other uh, theses about general trends in evolution. Uh, for example, you carefully distinguish the cooperation thesis from just the inherent complexity thesis. A lot of people talk that evolution just drives towards complexity. And then there's, you know, Gould and others have proposed, there's many counterexamples uh, to that. 
so I just want, if you could slow down just a little bit and pull that apart. There's no teleology here, and you're not just saying, oh, things are getting more complex. Uh, you have a much more fine-grained um, proposal that you're putting forth, and I think you make it more plausible precisely because of the specificity you bring to it. So if you could just open up that a little bit, like it's non-teleological, and it's yeah, so not... It's, and it's not simply things are just getting more complex. There's more going on in what you're saying. Yeah. So, and they're two very important points. Thanks for drawing them out. So I've taken great pains in my science, science papers um, to emphasise that it's non teleological. There's no pull from the future. Mm. And so what it's necessary to do to, to establish that is to, is, to, is to identify the causal micro foundations of, of these trends. That's what distinguishes it from you know, the glorious work of Teilhard de Chardin and other big picture thinkers. Yes. Essentially, so, so they essentially identified patterns. Um, and they, they and some people have been, like Ken Wilber does, for example, um, takes those patterns and, and attributes them to a pull from the future or yeah. eros, yeah. some additional force um, that's that's uh, inconsistent with uh, and not and doesn't arise out of you know the, the the small set of physical forces that have been described by physics. So I don't um, I uh, you know my work focuses on identifies identify, identifying the causal micro foundations and that's Uh, fall into the trap and in effect saving the big picture thinking of Teilhard de Chardin and others. So Teilhard de Chardin, de Chardin uh, you know, pointed to increasing integration through the, the evolutionary yeah. process, which is like this uh, the emergence of cooperation over increasing scales. But he didn't identify any causal micro foundations for that. And exactly. for that reason, um, basically science hasn't, contribute to the development my one way of describing my project is to identify John, those you, you, you froze there for a minute sorry john for interrupting you froze there for a minute could you go back a bit uh you were just talking about the hard de chardin and then you were contrasting and then you froze could you could you say it again please right so so uh tai had to show Chardin didn't didn't identify the causal micro right foundations of the large scale patterns that he identified. The, the difficulty with with that, or the limitation of that, is that until you identify the causal micro foundations, you can't predict. You can't extrapolate. You know, patterns causes arise in clouds in the sky. Uh, and to extrapolate those patterns is a, is a dangerous enterprise unless you can identify the causal micro foundations that form those patterns. When you understand those, you can then ask the question, will these same causal processes operate in the future? And if so, will they, you know, or, right. or will, right. will circumstances change to some extent? And, and if circumstances change to some extent, knowing the causal micro foundations then enables you to identify you know, what differences will arise in the future. Um, you, it also so, helps uh, with yeah. another issue, right, which is, you know, evolution, uh, and when you're trying to do these big picture things, you have to wrestle with the issue that evolution is going to fit to local environments, local niches. You need an account of the causal mechanisms that can account for that ability to fit to local environments, which a lot of these big picture views can't do very well. But you make a very good argument that cooperation works locally, but will also be general, generally applicable. I think that's a very powerful point that you make. Uh, if you could open that up a bit too, that'd be very helpful. Yes, it's uh, cooperation is a meta-adaptive trait. In right, the sense right. That, yeah, in the sense that it, it, it has local benefits, but those benefits are, um, uh, you know, extend more generally. So, I mean, broadly, it just comes down to this, that that effective cooperation, um, you know, has general adaptive benefits because 
uh, it enables specialization. Um, uh, the uh, it 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 produces organizations at larger scale. The larger the organization, the more resources it can command. Um, the greater the ability to modify its environment and so on. And that, I mean, that's immediately obvious if you contrast the, the millionth of a metre scale of cooperation yeah. of the first molecular processes with a human organisation on the scale of a continent. Um, you know, we, we can terraform, we can change the nature of the planet yes. uh, for, good and, for, for, for good and for bad. And we're doing it for bad at the moment. But coming back to... Um, Teilhard de Chardin, yeah, when I, I read Teilhard de Chardin first when I was an early teenager, and I thought, well, that's all pretty obvious, you know, he, he's, he's got, except for the religious stuff at the end, but the, yeah, his extrapolation. Right. Right. Um, and when I, so when I go to university and, and start doing, you know, studying evolution and so on, I'm waiting, you know, in first year, second year, third year, for the lectures on Teilhard de Chardin, and they never came. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, Partly that was because of the allergy to um, you know big picture thinking, but more but more so because he didn't identify causal micro foundations, and therefore right. he didn't ground his predictions and so on. So again, that that comes back to this issue of yeah common view amongst big historians and and um, uh, not so many published papers on it, but some amongst evolutionary scientists is that. There is a trend towards increasing complexity, and and that trend has been criticised and so on. The the trend towards increasing complexity um, is a very shallow and not a very powerful um, right, right. scientific regularity or observation right. or pattern, um, and that's that's because you know there's many 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 ways to become more complex. Exactly. And there's no inherent benefit in, you know, uh, in complexity itself. So if you want to get into the, the business of explaining what is, you know, what trajectory exists and so on, uh, complexity won't get you very far because the, it doesn't have causal micro foundations that point to the particular form of complexity that, are, that emerges and so on. Mm -hmm. And it won't enable you to do the extrapolation thing. So... So, you know, if, if so, coming down to an evolutionary activist, an evolutionary activist is someone who uses the understanding of, of the big evolutionary picture um, to contribute positively to the future evolution of life on Earth and then more widely, you know, in the universe. So uh, simply a, an understanding that the trend is, is towards increasing complexity won't fuel or ground such a project or right. mode of being in the world or set of goals or objectives because it says, okay, the, you know, the next step in, the evolu in evolution is for complexity to increase. So it begs the question of, well, what, what should I do then? You know, I mean, how do I increase complexity and, and so on? So coming down to this evolutionary activism, because this is the, you know, the absolute key to, uh, to what this big picture points towards. So up until now, the process has occurred automatically, driven by natural selection, right. no intention involved or, or anything else. Um, but when you get to the point of the emergence of a global superorganism, the hatching of a global, of a global superorganism, because this is like a developmental process where a chicken embryo you know, develops within an egg and then hatches as a... Yeah. Uh, and, and if you were a cell in a chicken embryo and you were conscious of what was going on uh, and becoming aware of what's going on, you'd see this developmental process where, yeah, complexity increases and, and structures appear and so on. And if you, you worked it all out, you might work out that this process is intended, intended and shaped by past evolution to hatch um, a chicken. Well, similarly, we're in a you know, I'm arguing that we're in a similar developmental process, but, it, but that happens automatically. So this is the difference to the chicken embryo developing. It happens automatically up to a point, but then it only happens intentionally. Right. And the reason why it has to, it can only happen intentionally after a certain point is because natural selection requires, you know, large populations 
of competing organisms uh, and the competition between them and the selection between them shapes yes. you know, the, the next steps and so on. Um, the, when, when you've got, got only a small number of nation states competing, uh, and when the next step is the, you know, the emergence of this global superorganism, there's the global super, superorganism isn't in a population of competing global superorganisms that will, in effect, through natural selection, drive the further right, development right, of, right, of right. global superorganism. Um, so, the and what what I mean by driving it further, you know, the the at, at the moment, uh, life on Earth is in effect the development of a metabolism. Mm -hmm. Uh, the and if and if we stumble into a global system, which we might, we almost did after the First World War and the Second World War, but in effect it was it was the you know that's what the League of Nations and the United Nations were were attempts to develop a global system, but in effect it was vetoed by the superpowers who didn't want to subject themselves to a, a higher level of governance. You know they didn't need to; they had the power to yeah. uh, advance their interests without that. Um, so the, uh, so the, our economic system, you know, might, we might stumble into a, a global system where we have global governance over the economic system and so on, but, but that is only a small step in the identification process that has occurred at all these previous levels. So the, the identification process involves, would involve this incipient global super, super organism becoming an entity in its own, own right, right, developing the capacity to adapt as a coherent, uh, and most particularly to use a, a term used by Stafford Beer, um, the great English systems theorist and Zen Buddhist. Uh, the the emerging global global superorganism needs to develop the capacity to adapt to the outside future. Mm -hmm. So adapting to the outside future means uh, adapting in interaction with your outside environment. It, it basically involves the development of goals and plans and strategies and actions. So it's agency. It's it's the development of agency. Mm -hmm. So so that's why, why I distinguish between sort of you know. The next steps involve we're, we're really at the metabolic level, the the unification of that metabolism, and the development of the capacities to act as an agent on the outside future. Uh, so where humanity, for example, uh, with the human the the system of life on Earth governed by humanity might interact with um, you know other global superorganisms that have emerged elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, of this identification process there is no natural selection there's no population of complete competing um global super, super organisms on this planet that will drive that process so it has to happen intentionally right. so humanity humanity needs to understand where evolution needs to go it needs to understand this identification process it needs to see how we need to organise ourselves on a global level to drive the sanitation process, this, the capacities that enable us to adapt to the outside future and develop our agency as a, as a superorganism. So that's, that's the key point. No, it was a bit laborious getting there, but, but the well, key well, point is, is that... Well, let me make sure, I, I, first of all, there's a term that you're using and you keep, it keeps garbling every time. I think you're saying antification? Antification. Right, the idea that it, it, it becomes an entity in its own right, and in some sense, it becomes an autopoetic thing. It, it becomes a self-making, caring for itself uh, kind of thing, if I understand. And yep. then- Yep, and that's then, the metabolic uh, part. Yes, right, uh, and that's sort of a bottom-up, but there also needs to be an intentional top-down element uh, because we do not have the requisite variation in nation states or super states in order to uh, evolve it. Uh, by sort of natural selection means. Am I understanding your argument correctly so That's far? It. That's right. Yep. And so, so the, two questions hmm. emerge immediately. One is, what does this conscious appropriation of this look like? What kind of, what does it mean for individuals? What do we need individuals to be doing? And secondly, how do we address concerns 
that people have about, you know, one world government and the, you know, Orwellian concerns, just to put it under an umbrella of, I don't want that. You know, I, I have enough trouble. I can hear a lot of people saying, I have enough trouble living in a nation state that is already surveilling me and in interfering with my life in so many ways. And, and I know you have an answer to both of those. Uh, what, what, do, what, what are individuals need to be doing um, in order to of afford the appropriation of the responsibility uh, for evolution? And secondly, how would that appropriation protect us, obviate us from sort of totalitarian possibilities? Okay, so what, what do individuals need to do? Well, first of all, individuals need to uh, understand the evolutionary process and where it needs to go. Right. They, they need to understand the trajectory of evolution on Earth and extrapolate that into the future. Um, and to do that, you need to understand the causal micro foundations to, to, because you need to get into the detail. Yeah. Yes. yes. Increasing complexity isn't enough and so on. So when you flesh all that out, you see, for example, that the way in which these... Um, Earth has climbed the ladder of increasing integration. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that, that that level is through the institution of a new level of governance. Yes. So the or constraint in the most general sense, you know, I use it in my papers is uh, you know a set of constraints, and those those constraints suppress the destructive competition that happened amongst the entities at the previous level. So the constraints, because they need to operate across a group and they need to uh, you know, suppress free riding and destructive competition, that requires power. That requires, that's hence governance, hence constraints. Furthermore, this, the, the new level of governance um, needs to be able to support cooperation. So it needs to be able to control the group, extract resources from areas where they're not of great benefit and move them to areas where they're of greater benefit and so on and, and, and reward cooperation. Because the, this, because the, I should mention that cooperation does not evolve easily. Yeah, that's, free riders are a problem, right? Free riders are a major problem. That's, that's right, so, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, famous for his book, The Selfish Gene. And while he's, he's resolved that to an extent in, uh, you know, in later publications, um, the, you know, fundamental issue for evolutionary biology, and it was when I was doing my degree, um, is how does cooperation emerge when the cooperator is investing resources uh, in cooperation? Um, and and doesn't necessarily capture the benefits of that cooperation. Yeah. Right. So the cooperation, the cooperator is being disadvantaged because uh, the cooperator is investing resources in cooperation that it may not get any return for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's the source of the tragedy of the commons. Yeah. You know, multipolar traps, collective action traps. You know, at all levels, at, at human levels, yes. and, and extending right back to the first emergence of life. Yes. And that's the universality of this mechanism that, that you need powerful constraints to emerge um, that punish the free riders, that make sure that, that taking benefits without giving in anything in return, in mm -hmm. other words, the absence of reciprocity, uh, making sure that that doesn't pay. So the constraints need to ensure that selfishness uh, doesn't pay, that cooperation in fact does pay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. doing that on the global level means, uh, you know, regulating nation states, um, ensuring that, you know, war doesn't pay. Um, in effect, doing what, what happened with the movement from disparate war in states in the United States to the formation of the United States by, you know, the establishment of federal governance that right. disarmed the states of America so that now... Um, you know, war between states within America is unthinkable. Uh, just as, you know, war between our left hand attacking our right hand is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and our souls sabotage in our body, except in cancer. You know, we were free riders who needed to be constrained and punished. Um, you know, uh, that it's unthinkable within our bodies. So, um, so at the, at the global level, we need, uh, you know, governance in order to create the conditions in which cooperation can emerge and flourish and, and the advantages of cooperation can, su can succeed and so on. Um, so that brings me to, you know, yeah, the issue. The, the, despite the fact that the United States of America were a wonderful example of the significance of governance, um, of a new level of governance that stopped civil wars and the death of you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans killing each other, Just, despite the fact that you know, they're a perfect example of, of this stepwise process, um, you know, to support global governance in the United States is ranked you know, lower than being a pedophile. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and we have we have like the evolution scientist David Simon Wilson, who's gradually coming to this view that you know the next step is the emergence of a, a global superorganism. Um, you know he has a, a, a pro evolutionary project called Pro Social. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is clear of you know mention of global governance because it would it would attract criticism and undermine his um, you know his his good work that he's doing at lower levels of, of organisation. So in any event, the the um, what of the possibility that this global governance could be used because it has the power you know to constrain everything below it. Yeah, and exploit, right? Right. And exploit. Yeah, and the and basically that's that brings me an interesting to an interesting point, a critical point about the emergence of um, governance at all previous levels. How does it emerge? You know, how, how does the, you know, so cooperation doesn't emerge easily. It's undermined by destructive competition and free riding and so on. So, so governance, you know, you can't just wave a magic wand and it, it, it appears. How does it occur? Well, mm -hmm. it occurs through the emergence of, of powerful organisms that have the capacity to constrain, uh, you know, control the behaviour of smaller scale, less powerful organisms. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the RNA of the cell, you know, emerged, uh, has the power to manage a cell, manage an autopoietic system, manage a metabolism, manage an autocatalytic, collectively autocatalytic system. Um, and so on, but but when it first emerges, you know, in a natural step by step evolutionary process, it it doesn't do that. That's a very complex thing for it to do. You know, it doesn't immediately leap arming a metabolism, because that's another very useful metaphor here. You know, it the farming metaphor where you farm yeah. a of of, yeah. of organisms. So it doesn't leap into that immediately. It, it starts by exploiting. So RNA. Initially, probably were free living, self-replicating, you know, large-scale, powerful molecules that move between uh, autocatalytic, collectively autocatalytic sets, and plundered them and moved on right, to another right. one. So, on. so yeah. it begins with exploitation, um, uh, and then the the RNA would emerge, or, or the powerful entities emerge which discover ways of, of manipulating and intervening in the, and farming the uh, metabolism uh, so that they can harvest an ongoing stream of benefits from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see that in, in human evolution. The, you know, the classic is uh, Genghis Khan, you know, who was a raper and a pillager. Um, but in a couple of generations, you know, the, the Khans produced Kublai Khan, who was one of the great uh, rulers of China, who didn't rape and pillage China any longer? He was a great governor who was able to, you know, manage the Chinese system to increase its productivity and so on. So you do far better by uh, effective farming than you do by raping and pillaging. So in any event, this so this is the kind of trajectory that occurs. So because a coincidence of interests arises between the governor and the governed, the governor becomes dependent upon the governed governed the uh the 
powerful entity, entity becomes dependent upon the uh, metabolism that it farms and a coincidence of interest arises. So does this happen at the global level? Um, because no, what drives it is, is competition between managed systems. Right. Ensures that the manager becomes a good manager, you know, a, a manager that doesn't rape and pillage, but manages the system it manages to maximise its productivity and, and survivability, eventually survivability. So an alignment of interests from the manager right. and the managed, there's more and more an alignment of interest. But again, that seems contingent on, you know, there being pretty stiff competition that's going to weed that's out right. the more exploitative. And again, that doesn't seem to be the case where we are. No, well, that's this great transition we're coming to where right. it can only succeed now intentionally. Now, these automatic processes that I've described that have yes, yes. caused all these previous steps, we know they need to occur. To, in order for you know, the global superorganism to emerge. But the processes that drove them unintentionally and unconsciously and automatically in the past no longer will drive it in the future. Mm -hmm. Therefore, therefore, you know, individuals and, and groups, human groups, need to become aware of these processes, need to see what, what needs to be done to cause the emergence of this next step, and then to put that into place. So it it involves you know, new roles, um, mm -hmm. new uh, participatory knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. the role of an evolutionary activist, which, which then, so it, it, it can fundamentally answer the question of what should we do with our lives? Well, what we should do with our lives is not to live to the dictates and satisfaction of our motivations and goals created by our past evolution. We should revise that salient, the salience landscapes that have been, you know, shaped by past evolution. Right, right. And uh, and engineer our own salience landscapes so that so that they're aligned with the needs of future evolution. So what so does that look, what does that look like? That that's where your work really starts to intersect with mine. I that's think right. in very powerful ways. So what does that look like? What what Again, how what how are we recommending? How how like what how do we make this turn? This is a metanoia. How do we to seize this kairos? Right, this is a turning point. As you you've you've given us this grand meta narrative, and you've given us a good, to my mind, structural argument why we're at a particular turning point. Right. Previously, this process relied. I, I don't want to use anthropomorphic language too too strongly here. But it, it relied on these automatic processes purely mechanistic in a sense, right? And we can't rely on that going forward. We need to turn and we need to turn in a way in which we're re-engineering, cultivating, I don't know what right the metaphor is, our salience landscaping, our cognition, our consciousness to help turn and um, appropriate the, the, these processes in an intentional and conscious fashion. Now that to me uh, sounds like something um, I don't think you'll object to this language, Sean. Th th that has like a religious feel to it uh, because it's, it's about doing something that religions have done too, which is propose ways of altering people's consciousness and cognition and community and character and trying to orient them in a different way and make use of cultural processes as opposed to just biological processes for directing very large scale human endeavor. Um, it, so I don't think it's inappropriate me for, to hear sort of a religious or spiritual dimension to this. It, it, does that land okay with you? Are you? Oh, is, absolutely. Because right. you know the there is nothing that's excluded from consideration right. uh, in relation to the evolutionary big picture. So there needs to be a thorough evolutionary understanding of the role of the emergence of religions, you know, yes. amongst human beings in these processes. And, and basically, religion is very important. They're, they're sets of constraints that are reproduced across individuals so that they can act across a group. And they're particular constraints that are pro-social. That is, they cause individuals who other, would otherwise act purely in their own self-interest, narrow self-interest. They cause them to act in the interests of the group as a whole. Mm -hmm. So the, it's 
the do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself um, is is a very pro-social injunction. Um, yes. It's a it's a, a wise way to organise a group to make it more effective if you're in competition with other groups. Um, the religiously constrained group, you know, can be far more effective at cooperating and competing with other uh, yes. other groups. Yes. yes. Um, so, so no, religion's, you know, part of this, but, it, but it's, it's about understanding religion, understanding what functions it performs. Exactly. Part, yes, yeah. And considering whether those functions, you know, uh, what relevance they, they have for the future. Um, so uh, yeah, you, you raised another important point there that's just I got uh, in relation to... Um, you know, the intersection with your work um, and the religious connotations of, uh, of what I'm talking about, um, ah, particularly. So the, it's said that any properly developed religion needs two components. It needs a set of injunctions about how you should live your life. Mm. And as I've said, the evolutionary function often is pro-social uh, to, to encourage pro-social behaviour. So you need a set of injunctions in a properly developed religion. And secondly, you need a set of technologies that enable you to actually live in accordance with those injunctions. Yes, yes, yes. And religions that don't have those technologies, you know, produce hypocrites, um, you know, people who can't, live out the injunctions and so on. So people whose religion tells them to love thy neighbour as thyself, but they hate any neighbour that's not like them. You know, that's... Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it produces. You know, the injunction is to turn the other cheek, but, you know, no, you, you are willing to go to war against um, Muslims or whatever. So, so, those, so a properly developed religion needs both. It's exactly the same in relation to um, being becoming an evolutionary uh, activist. Right. Uh, you basically you you have your set of injunctions that are derived from the evolutionary big picture, and they involve often will involve doing things different to what you've done in the past, um, and that might necessarily be intrinsically satisfying to you, given the predispositions that have been inserted in you by past evolution, cultural processes and, and socialisation. So you need to be able to free yourself from the dictates of the past, the past, the, the salience landscape that's been shaped by past evolution, right. genetic and cultural. You need to free yourself from that and, uh, and uh, instead find satisfaction in being an evolutionary activist and you know taking the steps that are needed to advance the evolutionary process on earth um so, so, so two, th two things that you mentioned that fit right into that if i can just interject here is you've talked you talk about sort of self-evolution and you talk about metasystemic cognition or metasystemic wisdom and these to me seems like these are some of if you've sort of canvassed some of the wisdom traditions and religion and pulled these out as meta traits um, that are particularly relevant uh, for being an evolutionary activist. Could you speak a little bit more towards that? Because I think that get, get is specifically what, like, what we're talking about right now. What does it mean to turn from the, you know, our, our inherited, our biologically inherited salience landscaping to that, you know, that conscious appropriation of the need for, uh, to, to, to direct evolution or afford it um, for more enhanced cooperation. And you talk about self-evolution self and uh, metasystemic wisdom. And I think that's particular, that would be very helpful to, uh, you know, really specify what we're talking about here right now. Right. So, so self-evolution um, basically is the second component of any um, fully developed religion. That is, it's the, the set of technologies Right. Uh, that you use on yourself to modify yourself so that you can carry out the injunctions of the religion. So in, in, 
in terms of evolutionary activism, it's exactly the same. It's it's the you're serving future evolution as an evolutionary activist, not past evolution. So it might require you to have goals and and take actions and so on that are different to those that you would take if you were di dictated to by previous evolution. So you need to free yourself from the dictates of past evolution and you need those technologies. So it's, it's basically the same technologies um, that properly developed religions have, but developed further um, and optimised uh, to enable you, know, you to become an evolutionary activist and, and serve the interests of future evolution rather than past evolution. So, so that's why I've, plun I've plundered um, <laughs> the resources developed and the techniques and practices developed by, uh, you know, the spiritual and religious traditions. Um, but I, I, the plundering process, uh, the stealing of these, these practices, their appropriation, uh, involves basically, you know, a science-based process. Yes. So it's... Which, which desirably is the goal of, of um, cognitive science in general. I think so. Uh, yeah. So, so the it's stripping. It's it's so. If you look across religious traditions and religious practices, you find uh, that the experiences are the same. You know that they relate to. So they have different names for it. But the 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 states that they create. These enabling states that enable transcendence. Uh, of your biological and evolutionary past, um, they are the same. They're, they're, they're the same kinds of st states. They're universal human potentials, but their justification for the states, the stories behind the states, Very, and everything. Yeah. The hocus pocus, and they must be hocus pocus because they're mutually contradictory. So yeah, they're, yeah. they're nearly all. Even if you ascribe to you know, one set of religious stories about these practices. You're rejecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of other stories about them that, that are yeah. embedded in other religions and so on. So, so the goal of, of science um, and its role in founding, a, uh, you know, uh, this pro-evolutionary uh, view of how we need to behave as evolutionary activists and so on, the goal of science is to strip these practices of their hocus pocus. Um, to understand them in terms of brain processes, you know, why, why, why are human beings an organism that's organised in such a way that we meditate? Yes. You know, yeah. what are the brain processes, what are the affordances that meditation can provide and so on? And it's only when you can build science-based models um, that explain meditation and the states it produces, it's, it's only when you can do that that you can optimise the technologies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before the rise of industrialization, the, there were folk theories about all sorts of things and folk physics about all sorts of things and so on. But it was the replacement of that, it was the stripping of that knowledge because there was knowledge about physics and forces mm -hmm. and so on uh, prior to, prior to the, the first in European Enlightenment and so on. That knowledge existed, but, but it uh, but it was embedded in the hocus pocus. So science, in effect, stripped the hocus pocus out, developed objective, mechan you know, mechanistic models um, uh, of of these um, of the of physics and so on. And once it did that, it unleashed an enormous wave of creativity. Yes, yes. Because those, those models, those mental models, uh, enable you to, ex in effect, experiment in your mind. Uh, you know, with how to optimise the, the various components of those models, uh, how to, you know, embed them in an appropriate context, how to, how to get them to operate in different contexts from those in which they, you might have originally encountered them and so on. Um, so that objectification of, uh, you know, the states and experiences that underlie religious experiences that objectification of it is, is critical to, you know, creating a successful evolutionary activist. So, so let, let me let me let me see if I, I can ma uh, map some connections here. 
And I do want to come back to the metasystemic cognition too. Yes. So, so we're trying to get people to lift their head out of the evolutionary trough, so to speak, right? And, and, uh, and take a turn and, and change um, their fundamental orientation. And the, the, uh, there's lots of variation am amongst religions and their claims. But I'm thinking, for example, of McNamara, you know, um, who's done a cognitive, cognitive not a neuroscientific and cognitive scientific work. Uh, you find universals of, of processes like decentering, which help overcome a, 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 an otherwise unchallenged super salience of an egocentric framework. And you get religion, uh, various religions. Again, I agree with you. They have a lot of local variation, uh, which might have been part of their evolutionary success too, right? Because they fit a particular context, right? They, right? They, they have a lot of variation about why they're doing this or right, uh, uh, the metaphysics around it. But they share the what I would call the procedural and perspectival operation and participatory transformations, making people decenter, get less egocentric, and that allows them. Well, we know that allows them to pursue more long-term goals. It allows them to cooperate. And in general, if you do this with people, they can pursue long-term goals. They're more willing to cooperate, construal level theory, etc. So there's a lot of work that says, right. We could we 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 if we if we understand the functionality of this, um, then as you said, we can uh, more explicitly appropriate it. Uh, we can optimize it in various ways. And then what I hear you saying is, okay, let's take that and then let's optimize it so people turn to look at what's the future, what 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 is the future rather than being a salience landscaping that is bound to the past. Now. Two things, and I, I did put a pin, I wanna come back to the metasystemic, but I can hear a lot of people, there's two worries coming up. One is, well, we tried this, we've tried this before, social Darwinism, that was a disaster. And you alluded to that about the 1940s, right? We came out of, um, we came out of two grand programs that tr saw, claimed to see the future of human evolution. Uh, and they were pseudo religious ideologies, communism and Nazism. And they both drench the world in blood. How do we, how do you, I, I, I know what, I know you're going to be able to respond to this. So this is an open question, but I want you to be able to address people who that concern is raising, rising in their mind. Like, well, how do we make sure we don't do that? And secondly, I can hear my more, my more philosophically inclined people saying, oh, this is just the naturalistic fallacy all over the place. You're confusing is and ought. Uh, evolution is a description of how things are, and then you're turning it into a prescription on how we ought to behave. And how did you make that 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 move? Um, so, uh, so John, if you could reply to those, and then I'll try and keep in my mind that I want to come back because I uh, this self evolution is really cool, and I want to come back to the meta systemic cognition because I think that's another really important thing. But I, I think it's fair to say that those concerns I raised are going to be in people's minds as they're listening to you right now. Um, and I, I know and I know you have good re re replies to both. So I'd like I'd like you to address right. those right now. Well, yeah, first I, you've reminded me that I need to, to finish off that fundamental question about one world governance, legal yes. exploitation. And the tyranny, yes, yes, and yes. tyranny, that's right. So, so the, the entification process, um, you know, has occurred previously, the mm -hmm. entification, that led to cells, the identification that led to multicellular organisms and so on. And we can see right. how that process needs to be arranged through some form of governance, suppressing destructive competition and so on, uh, and, and how you need alignment of interests uh, mm -hmm. for not to lead to exploitation. And, and you see what effective, effective management or governance of a, of a cooperative collective uh, how it needs to be arranged and, and how it needs to be, how it, how it optimizes the identification process. Because the, because the end goal of the identification process of a global superorganism is to produce a highly adaptive global superorganism that can participate in the future evolution of life in the universe, link up with and communicate with and speak with one voice um, you know, to other global superorganisms. Uh, and do whatever you know, collective activities they get involved in and, and so on. Because this process on this planet's happened elsewhere, it's happening now, it's happened before, you know, it'll it'll happen in the future. So the 
So if we look at the identification process, we see that this is why it needs to be driven intentionally as well. We see that the identification uh, that for it to be successful, for it to produce a highly adaptive entity, it needs to maximise the adaptability of its components or evolvability of its components. Right, so right. It, it, the, uh, it needs also to promote diversity because there's a very fundamental principle about requisite variety that, that emerged out of cybernetics and systems science, you know, 50 years ago. Um, the principle of requisite variety, which is that you can only be adaptive, you can only be creative insofar as you have this variety within the organization itself. Right, right. If you have a, yeah, so, a, and, and this is manifest clearly in, uh, you know, scientific management, Taylorist organizations, uh, they're very good for, you know, a franchise model and running a McDonald's right. um, franchise, but they're absolutely hopeless. Um, you know, so mechanistic forms of management and mechanistic forms of organisation and rule-based organisations that don't maximise the evolvability of their constituent individuals uh, do not lead to effective, evolvable, right. creative organisations. Right. 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 So, it's, so it's, I won't go into more detail on that, but it's very clear that the identification process that has to be intentionally driven uh, is cannot be authoritarian, um, cannot be domin dominating, cannot be, uh, you know, a command economy sort of arrangement and so on. So the question arises is, how do you constrain the governance? And this is the fundamental issue. Yep. In the absence of this competition that, that shapes governance and constrains it and, and ensures that its interests are aligned with the interests of the governed, um, you, need, you need to constrain the governance to achieve that, that in the absence of natural selection. So when, as human societies increased in scale, there was a reduction in competition between them, as a, therefore a reduction in the force that would tend to align interests. So hence the emergence of, of democracy yes. and, the, and the French Revolution and so on. They were mechanisms that arose to constrain the, the governed. Right. You know, the Magna Carta was a beginning one, but it was a pathetic, you know, overblown attempt. It only, it was the nobles constraining the king, right. not the people constraining the king and so on. Right. So there is an evolutionary trajectory there as well. Um, an evolutionary trajectory that has lessons for the future. Um, so global governance has to be set up so that the governance, the powerful, the powerful governance is constrained itself to align its interests with those of the government. So there's a technology there that I won't go into in, in any detail. So now you've, you've, risen the, you've raised the issue of oh, the naturalistic fallacy. I'll, I'll deal with that next. So yeah, you, the analytic philosophers tell us that you can't get an ought from an is, that any given set of facts about, you know, where we need to go in evolution doesn't, can't found oughts about how we should behave here and now. Um, the, the fallacy behind underlying the naturalistic fallacy uh, is that it presupposes an individual who has no warts, mm -hmm. starts off without warts, and asks the question, you know, how can I get an ought? Yes, yes. And, and says, well, you can't, you know, and which is, you know, absolutely true in logical terms. But the dead giveaway for the fallacy is that the analytic philosophers who say that, including Hume um, and others, uh, then admit that they don't live their life according to that at all. They live their life with oughts everywhere. You know, yes. yeah. If you yeah. drop all your oughts, you stop breathing, you stop, you know, you stop yeah. doing anything. Yes. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and you can't found oughts. So, so if you lived according to the naturalist fallacy, but no one's ever lived, you can only die according if you apply the naturalistic fallacy you can't live according to it so so where that leads us to is to say well all human beings have oughts we are not the the human the individual human does not start without oughts the human being has oughts um, implanted in us by past evolution socialization cultural evolution and so on so so the the issue becomes is the 
the desire to maintain the big show, the evolutionary show, the big picture, keep this whole show going, surviving and thriving into the future. Is that consistent with universal orts that human beings tend to already be fitted out with? Yes. So it's not a matter of generating you know, the big evolutionary ought from nothing. It's about saying, well, you know, is, is the, is it's it a, a meta art? If that art isn't satisfied, all the individual arts that people pursue that's will right. undermine. That's the, basically the move you're making, right? So, yes. so yeah, every, everything, all the struggle, all the, the thinking, all the theories, all, all the wars, all the sacrifice, everything that's happened in human history, you know, it was rendered meaningless if, if we wink out of existence yes. this century, you know, as we quite possibly will. Um, so the, so the, you know, so it's consistent, yeah, the meta ought that's consistent with and demanded by, you know, any orts generally that human, that a fully functional human being has demands the big evolutionary ought and founds the big, the big evolutionary ought. So, so uh, you've got the yeah you've got this the meta art saying right like we have we have to not only survive we have to thrive or or else everything and then you're saying okay we need to satisfy the meta art where can we look for our best chances of not only surviving but thriving we can we can glean from big the big history of evolution what is the most plausible proposal for how to satisfy the meta art, and then we can consciously align ourselves individually and collectively towards it. Am I understanding you correctly? That's, yeah, absolutely. So, so the identifying a trajectory to evolution, and we, we might well have lived, found, woken up in a universe you know, that had no trajectory to evolution. Yes, yes, it might yes. all be random and crap, but, yes, yes. but no, there is a trajectory of evolution. When you identify it, what, what, a, what a trajectory of evolution defines is what survives. Yes. So, so the trajectory at lower levels is, you know, a hell of a lot of organisms had to die because they weren't on the trajectory, you know, in order to define the trajectory. Well, we can do it intentionally. Uh, you know, we don't have to be subject to natural selection. We can avoid, we can anticipate, preempt natural selection and do it ourselves. Yeah. So, so one of the things with the, the superorganism, uh, would do, given your previous argument, it, it, it would support like uh, the diversity and the evolvability of, uh, of its components, of, 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 of smaller groups and of individuals. And, and you've, you've spoken to that. Um, and, and then I wanted to come back to the idea of metasystemic uh, wisdom, metasystemic cognition, um, because it seems like you're, you're proposing kind of a way, a, a, a way of thinking that will also help us shift our habits of problem solving uh, from you know our evolutionary heritage in towards affording and turning them towards affording um, uh, uh, the evolution of the uh, 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 of our uh, uh, of our future I suppose is what I want to say right. so so just just to you know emphasize a point here that the trajectory of evolution involves this emergence of progressively larger scale cooperative organizations but Part of that trajectory is increased evolvability. So that, yep. that frames the, yes. know, the move. Yep, yep. yep. The, and evolvability is basically the ability to search possibilities space for effective adaptations. So you can search possibility space by trial and error, which is what you know genetic evolution originally yep. did. Yep. You stumble around in the dark until you hit on something that works and so on. Or eventually you can search the space far more effectively by the development of uh, human cognition in the form of mental models. Yes. Where yeah. we form mental models of reality as best we can. And then in those mental models in our heads, we test out possibilities and see whether they'll be effective, you know, and use our mental models to predict the, the consequences of those, um, those things we try out in our heads. So as, as the great, you know, evolutionary um, philosopher Karl Popper said, uh, in humans with our mental capacities, our ideas die in our stead. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so the, 
we form these models of reality. Um, ideally, you know, our models have got to include uh, the large scale, the biggest picture of reality. Yes. Because as, as Tehar Dushardin said, evolution is the line to which all other lines must conform. It is the, it, it has to be, it is the, the meta narrative. But it's an expanding one because our view of evolution will, you know, evolve uh, through time. But the ultimate step in evolvability is to use our, um, you know, mental models of the big picture. However, you know, we've been monumentally unsuccessful at doing that. Humanity has um, up until now. And to, to identify why, you know, I'll, I'll distinguish between what I'll call first enlightenment thinking and second enlightenment thinking. Okay. Second enlightenment thinking is metasystemic wisdom, metasystemic cognition, and so on. Right. Um, and you might well ask, well, what's the second enlightenment? And I'll tell you, it's yet to come. Right. Yes. yes sir. But it'll be as monumentally impactful as the, the first enlightenment. So the first enlightenment was the emergence of abstract rational thinking, the development of mental models that we could use logical principles to, mm -hmm. to, to edit and to optimize and so on. And we could use abstract because uh, logical principles are abstract. So they're abstract, rational, analytical, rational models. Um, but they're models that, you know, like the analytic philosophers who are hopeless at almost everything, um, can only deal can only deal with mechanistic um, parts of reality. So Alfred North Whitehead pointed out, you know, nearly a hundred years ago, that science can only deal with about ten percent of the things that really matter to human beings, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the rest is too complex, and science can't deal with complexity. Because first enlightenment thinking, analytical rational cognition, can only come up with mechanistic mental models. And most of reality isn't mechanistic. Most of reality is ceaselessly changing complex systems that are interacting and evolving through time. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't think through it. You can't reduce it to a set of interacting components that you can think through logically using first enlightenment thinking so you know and there's lots of ways of describing this second enlightenment thinking but it's true complexity thinking you know so true complexity thinking which you know some would say you know is emerging in science and so on um the is second enlightenment thinking but but what passes for nearly all complexity thinking um whether it's in evolution physics uh, anything in the world today is a analytical rational reduction of complexity. So the the because the only thing that's publishable largely, you know, except in little niches in, in academia, yeah, right. yeah, certainly yeah. in science, the only thing that's publishable is stuff that conforms to the tenets of first enlightenment thinking. Uh, so it's got to be analyzable, desirably mathematizable, mm. um, and uh, basically mechanistic, be able to be thought through, be able to be, so, so you can't through, a, through writing on paper or a set of words describe complex phenomenon because there's so many interacting parts, you can't keep track of them or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so cybernetics, general systems theory, throughout the 20th century, the great minds of the 20th century have periodically said we need a complexity science you know and they say there was holism of general smuts and yeah. and um and the cybernetics wiener and and so on the yeah the francis haligan you know the leader of my research group set up principia cybernetica on the, the web um you know to bring cybernetics to the world and so on um and the santa fe institute and then complex adaptive systems and so on um but generally, that's all the the when the when when these the great minds started moving, trying to develop true complexity understanding of reality, and tried to publish it, then first enlightenment thinking drags them back in again. Mm. Uh, 
like in The Godfather, because it applies first enlightenment thinking criteria to judge whether, you know, papers published and, and so on. So the, okay, so true complexity thing. So one way of describing it is that if you read a scientific paper writ written by a true complexity thinker, then their views, their, their true, their metasystemic wisdom or cognition to develop a paper uh, to, to derive certain principles that can be written in a paper and, and presented in a, in a way that conforms with first enlightenment thinking. Then if anyone reads that paper, they won't get the model. They, there's no transmission of the model from the metasystemic thinker to them. Um, the model that generated those. Right, the, right. Yeah. So that, so in any event, that's, that's a very brief. No, no, no I, I, I want to, I want to stop. I want to actually stop on that. Uh, I don't want to, that's, I think that's a very important point, right? There's there, right. The, the thinking that generated the theory, um, that theory does not then regenerate it in the people that are reading the theory, right? And so it, it is not transformative communication in any way. It's merely informative and it's referring to uh, complexity. It's referring to dynamic self-organization, but it's not actually affording people thinking that way who are, are perusing these theories. Am I understanding you correctly? Exactly. That's, that's brilliantly summarized. I should let you just write my stuff up and <laughs> no, 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 but, uh, no, but, uh, but to, to, I mean, I, in, in part of what I've been trying to do with talking about the multiple ways of knowing is to bring out that the propositional is insufficient for the procedural and the perspectival and the participatory. And we need ways of communicating and doing, you know, our epistemic projects that exemplify, right, um, you know, the perspectival and the procedural and, and the participatory. I've been trying to use this medium and I've been trying to create dialogical, dynamic, right, processes by which ideas are being developed rather than the monological mathematical presentation of a polished product. I've been trying to show people in a way in which they can participate in the process and be transformed by it, even more so than uh, adopting the particular propositional conclusions that come. So I've been trying to I've been trying to use this medium in particular to, to say, no, 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 it's really focus much more on this process. And notice how, you know, how dynamic and, and complex and this process is. That's why I'm doing so much, so many series where I'm doing it with multiple people because I'm trying to say, don't pay attention. I mean, this is Heraclitus. Don't just pay attention to what I'm saying. Pay attention to the logos. Pay attention to all of this self-organization that's happening. Um, so I think that's another place uh, where my work is converging with that point you were just making about you know, the strangle, I call it propositional tyranny, the stranglehold that in, you know, enlightenment 1.0 thinking has on people trying to communicate, right, the, the, the kind of cognition, the states of consciousness, the cultivation of character, the cultivation and participation in communitas that is needed in order to address our problems. Um, and the fact that we can't, we've got to come up with different ways of presenting this other than the paper pencil publication methods that we are bound to in academia right now. Sorry, I'm going on a bit of a speech here, but uh, I just I, I just want to I, I want to say something in my own work that's deeply convergent with that point that you just made. And, and so back to you, John. Uh, so, okay, uh, so what? So what, what, what yeah, about the what you're describing. What yeah. you're describing is what I would call second enlightenment science. Right, which does not yet exist. Yes. It'll be a new. It'll be a new, a genuinely new kind of science. It won't be analytical rational. It won't conform to the criteria and tenets of analytical rational science. To analytical rational science, it's all wave, hand waving nonsense. That's that's how you see it at the lower level, looking upwards. Um, and in two thousand and eleven, I co-organised. Uh, the first planning meeting for the second enlightenment. No, oh, wow. Which was, which, which was on a boat in Sausalito. And Otto Lasky was there, plus leading lights from Integral, uh, Sean Esborn Hagens, Terry Patton uh, was there, and so on. Didn't yeah. get very far because um, I don't, you know, I, if you sit, because 
the, the, you know, the goal now is to have a second planning meeting for the second enlightenment. But sitting, and I've been looking at it with uh, a colleague, um, and the first thing is to identify people who can contribute to it, because the goal is to build an escalator. So an escalator is a set of practices and approaches that scaffold uh, people moving from first enlightenment cognition to second enlightenment cognition. Right, right, right. right. Uh, you know, the technology, the procedural knowledge of how to um, uh, recursively self-improve, you know, cognition and birth the second enlightenment. Um, but there's hardly anyone on the planet. <laughs> And, and obviously that was why, you know, I was so excited to talk to you um, because you're, you're building that, that the synthesis of, of, you know, right brain and left brain, mm -hmm. which is needed for, you know, metasystemic wisdom and so on. So just, just to hone in on that just a little bit, because, because this, again, I've noticed in your most recent writings that there is real convergence and synergy here. Um, True systems understanding, uh, the mental models that, that can represent systems, uh, requires the use of, of brain resources that are not thought-based. Thought yes. Um, so they require, for example, something as simple as pattern recognition. Yes. yes. So pattern recognition resources are not non-propositional. Yes. I mean... You can reduce them to propositions with a combinatorial explosion, and you yes, know, yes, 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 achieve nothing. But uh, like a picture's worth a thousand words. But you know, you human being, you don't describe the picture in a thousand words. You show them the picture, and yeah, yeah. And, and they'll be able to recognise it, and so on. So, so intuition, yeah, images, and and so on. Those resources, because because what what you're trying to represent with models of complex phenomena is processes, you know, because in, in reality, there is no such thing as a thing. There's no such thing as an object. There are only processes. There are only things that were something previously and are becoming something different, you know, in the, yes. in the future. So how do you capture that in words? You can't. How do you capture that in logical thinking? You can't. Can't capture it with analytical, analytic philosophy. Um, so you need these other resources. Um, to be able to build metasystemic cognition, mm. models of complex reality. So how do you do that? How do you bring in these other resources? And that's where, you know, I've stolen from the and plundered the, um, the religious and contemplative traditions yeah. because pres presence or no thingness, you know, as you sort of describe it, or the witness state or, or these states uh, decentering whatever, they involve uh, cleansing consciousness of thinking, stilling the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the critical thing to understand about consciousness in the development of higher cognition is that consciousness is very low bandwidth. Uh, there's a user illusion that it can be infinite, particularly if you, uh, you know, don't contract consciousness down with thought or emotion. But that's an that's a user illusion. Uh, you know, the this is the grand illusion, you know, of consciousness right. and so on. So it's very low bandwidth. It's so yes. the bandwidth of consciousness is very easily taken up. It's like consciousness, uh, you know, I liken it to looking at the world through a straw. Yes. And if you fill the straw with sequences of thought, then you, you don't you're not recruiting any other resources. You're not using any other resources. Um, if you, you know, fill the straw with shallow emotional reactions and thinking, that's, that's all you'll be aware of. So if you go into deep thought, the world disappears. You know, you're only aware of your deep, your deep thought. And most people are in thought, you know, we're, we're tyrannised by thinking at the present time. So we don't have access to... The, the unconscious mind, which is where this giant unconscious mind, we, we think that the thinking mind, you know, is who we are. And, and that's, um, you know, that's what determines our behaviour. But the unconscious mind, which operated before thinking ever arose in human beings. Mm, very powerful. And human beings still have relationships, you right. know, brought up children, did nearly, you know, lots of things that, 
that uh, complex things uh, did complex things more effortlessly than we do today, because now we, we're confronted with complex circumstances. And the idiot, the thinking mind of Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare's technical term for the thinking egoic mind is the idiot right. who tells the tale of our life. Yes. Um, the, the, yes. Macbeth, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, you know, the idiot doesn't have access to these sources and the idiot faced with complexity starts thinking about it, trying to think it through, trying to reduce it and so on and, and fails miserably. So this giant, the, the resources of the unconscious, which is where our pattern recognition resources, our emotional system, our emotional system, which can appraise a complex social circumstance in an instant when we walk into a room and we survey the room with a still mind. Yeah, we know what's going on. Yeah, you know, we immediately pick up factions and little things going on and so on. Trying to think that through autistically in the absence of you know these resources would um, would would bog us down. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like uh, Conrad Lorenz, the great animal behaviorist. The example he gives, uh, he says, if you want to paralyze a centipede, then you ask it what its a hundredth leg is doing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 99th leg is touching the ground. So it's interfering with these complex automatic processes with your conscious thinking mind. You know, you, you can't, you, to try and regulate your body with this wonderful thinking mind, which we think the whole show is insane. You know, we don't know how anything in our body works. So thank God it bloody well works. So, yes. so so this is so second enlightenment science, second enlightenment cognition, um, metasystem cognition involves the marriage of the bride and the groom, the marriage of right and left brain. Yes. It in, involves access to the, uh, the resources of the unconscious, the non-thought-based, non-conscious uh, resources that just emerge into consciousness. You know, one, one thing that's been said, it's, it's a very surprising thing when, when you first hear it from most people is that a properly functioning, self-evolving human being, their unconscious mind will operate like their conscious mind does now. So impressions will penetrate straight through unimpeded to the unconscious mind and drag out relevant resources. Mm -hmm. While we think we've got to intervene with our thinking and, and figure it out and so on. So how do you do it? How do you access the unconscious resources, of the unconscious mind, which is essential scaffolding for developing um, metasystemic cognition, uh, second enlightenment, thinking and science and so on. You do it through presence, uh, no thingness. You do it through stilling the mind because what, what stilling the mind does is unload the straw of consciousness, uh, unload the thinking and emotional reaction from it. Stilling the mind, that's why it becomes spacious awareness. Uh, you still the mind. Um, it's why it feels so good because you don't have all the negative thinking that, and the negative emotions arising and so on. But most importantly, so that's that you'll get that on the meditation couch. But the evolutionary activist, you know, isn't about cleaning the straw of consciousness on the meditation couch. He wants to awake or she wants to awake in the midst of ordinary life. Right. Uh, and neither do they want to do it in a in a specially convened, you know, group. Uh, that has particular practices and so on, while, whilst that can be instructive and beneficial and so on. The, but the, you know, the Holy Spirit might visit, which is, you know, collective presence, the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so on. Um, the, the evolutionary activist needs to awaken in the midst of ordinary life. So be in the present, not embedded in thinking, have a still mind, be in spacious awareness. Uh, when they're doing it, what they normally do in, in ordinary life. So when they relate to another human being, so in, in the circling process that you've been involved in, it's magnificent for relating, for producing, you know, uh, states in which individuals can connect and relate more deeply than they ever have before in yes. their existence. Yes. So collectively, they will hizzle each other. So hizzle is... HSL, hear, see, and love. Yes. So if you've got a, if you've, if you're in the state of presence, no thingness, the witness state, then you will, and you experience other human beings, you will hear 
them deeply for the first time, see them deeply for the first time, and you love them. You love everybody because there's no thinking going on, labelling, you know, yes. and so on. You're just pure awareness, pure impressions going through to your unconscious, interpreting them without thought, and therefore interpreting and understanding their every nuance of their behaviour and and um, facial expression and within the context and, and doing that far better than your analytical thinking mind could ever, ever do it. So that's, yeah, that's in, you can create a special environment that facilitates that and scaffolds that. But the end goal for the evolutionary activist, because it's, it's, it's not just about producing, you know, deep and profound experiences, it's about being more effective in the world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think of these practices, um, um, and I'm trying to get also build practices that transfer from those training situations into life. The issue of transfer, I think, is really paramount. Um, and I think about it as you're, you're sort of learning enhanced relevance realization. And then the idea is to take that um, into the world, that capacity for enhanced relevance realization. Um, I agree with you that um, that's why I've been trying to foreground this whole issue of transfer of practice. Um, you, you, you can get caught up too much in the wonderful phenomenology of a practice and not actually been practicing it in a way that affords that transfer outside of where, you know, outside of whatever the training context is. People do need training context. They need to simplify situations. They need to, you know, they, they, have, they have to face utilization deficiency. I, no denying that, but that can become very almost incestuous, incestuous and insular and people can get caught up. Yeah, it's pardon me? But what did you say? I didn't hear you, John. So you're talking to me? Yeah. Ah, oh, no. Yeah, there's, it's a form of spiritual masturbation. Yes, So mas yes. masturbation is the delinking between, you know, a, a way of stimulating positively our, our hedonic system delinking it from any evolutionary purpose oh i see i see the metaphor oh that's wonderful yeah so that's you can not... you can masturbate physically uh sexually emotionally yeah uh, intellectually and spiritually yes so and, yeah the issue of transfer i think needs to be made paramount and um and that's also that's also a pedagogical issue um uh, this has to do with uh, and we can talk about this another time you know, the, the, the framing of pedagogy itself is also something that needs to be taken up into what you're calling second enlightenment. Because the way we do pedagogy now is we are orienting it uh, increasingly short termism, increasingly just for um, how, how we can insinuate people into the market. And we've lost the intergenerational aspect of education that is so important for the very project you're talking about. If we do not see ourselves as bound to the generations before us and especially the generations after us. If that's not a primary thing our education is inculcating in us, then the projects that you and I are talking about here right now are not possible, right? If people have not got that, that commitment and that, ident that cross-generational identification going, then you know none of, none of this is going to, uh, well, I would argue, the, the attempt to bring about evolutionary activism is bound to fail because people are just going to say, I don't care. Uh, I, I don't care about the next generations at all. So people, people can masturbate at all levels. They can also commit suicide at all levels. Yes, yes. So, the, yeah. so I, I joke about, you know, the, oh, the, kid who the, goes to, the kid who goes to school and uh, does first grade and refuses to move to second grade and he stays in first grade all his life. Well, you can go, you know, graduate and refuse to go to university or you can refuse to go into some wider environment and then refuse yeah. to know about your nation's political system and so on. So you commit suicide to the wider context. So you, so there's evolutionary suicide is, is, so people can say, yeah, I don't care about the future. And now you can, there's practices where you can take them through envisaging and feeling their way into. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. the future and so on there's things you can do there but there's yeah something i want to mention on um just quickly on, on the religious and spiritual traditions that one way of characterizing you know this this 
the need for transformation into the midst of ordinary life is to say that you know the, there's two large processes of, of um, self-development, the right-hand path and the left-hand path. The, the right-hand path is the traditional spiritual and contemplative tradition path, and that leads, its goal is absorption in the absolute. Right. Right. And the maximum for the the maximum for the right hand path is thy will be done. Mm -hmm. So it's not about enhancing agency. So the left the left hand uh, sorry the left hand path, um, it's about developing agency, developing capacity, developing effectiveness in the world, and its maximum is my will be done. Yes. So it has, now it can be, you know. Uh, misused as well, you know, through Satanism and and so on. But broadly, the you know there there are there's very similar technologies between the two. Yes. Um, however, the the right hand path, the the absorption in the absolute, doesn't use the technologies, doesn't use presence in and so on, in order to uh, build enhanced capacity, agency, and so on. Yes. Well, yes. well the, the left-hand path is all about appropriating those techniques and using them. So it's that transformation thing. It's about... Yeah, there's freedom from and freedom to uh, spiritualities. Uh, yes. Right? And yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So uh, arguably, the, 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 you know, the, the spiritual traditions that have survived till today obviously have been subject to evolutionary processes, select, selection processes. And the, the, because every part of this planet has been subject to more or less continual war yeah. and mutual destruction um, yeah, for thousands of years, then any spiritual tradition that, that focused on increased agency and capacity to act in the world would be a threat you know, to one side or another. It would be selected out. It would be obliterated. So the most benign form, which is the right-hand path, the thy will be done, you know, the monks in robes, in, in arcs, Noah's arcs, which are monasteries, yes. you know, high up in the mountains, that's, that's survived till today. Uh, and it's now our role, you know, as, and this is part of what the West can bring to the, the extraordinary discoveries of the Eastern spiritual tradition, what the West can do is to translate is to appropriate those um, right hand path uh, absorption processes uh, and practices and and use them for enhancing agency and effectiveness and yeah. so on yeah. in the service of our future evolutionary needs. Yes. Well, John, we're going to have to we, we're going to have to bring it to a close. You and I will talk again, of course. I think this was just a good uh, primer for uh, uh, so people can get a sense of what you're doing and why you reached out to me and why it's good that we're talking. So first of all, I'd like you to come back and do another Voices with Raveki and we can go back to some of these other points and these other themes and open them up again. Um, you, you said a lot of things, and I mean this as a compliment, they were very provocative and I'm sure uh, some stuff will come out in the comments and commentary and that, uh, so there's gonna be lots to do about this. But um, I always like to, first of all, I wanna thank you and then I always like to give people like the last sort of brief word uh, before I, uh, I I close off the recording. Is there any final brief thing you'd like to say? No, I, I think I've said enough provocatively. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I really appreciate talking to you. I mean, on a personal level, um, yeah, it's just wonderful to talk to someone with uh, who's developing metasystemic cognition. So it's extraordinarily rare in the world like unfortunately, because we need it to survive and thrive. Well, thank you for saying that. And I agree with that. And I obviously see that in you, which is why we were able to resonate. So thank you again very much.